want to take your seats again? We'll get started for the second half. Any questions up to now? I think this is if we have any questions coming. I didn't get to answer questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to chat with everyone during the break. Um, let's see, we left off here about approximately. Um, with a single cell model, so we're still talking about single neurons, and we've gone, we've defined the GLM as this mathematical object that's got a linear transformation, followed by a stretching nonlinearity, followed by some noise. And we focused on spike counts, so we've tended to wor work with Poisson, but we could have worked with Bernoulli, or exponential, or gamma, or other, other models, or we could go with non-exponential family models as well. There's nothing to stop us from doing that. But um, <clears throat> the one thing we notice is that if we add, if we make the model autoregressive, is another name for this, have the model's outputs feed back onto itself, we can get a good deal more uh, flexibility out of it. Uh, it's more interpretable and more, um, yeah, more powerful model to capture the kinds of things that we know real neurons can do. I had a few questions after, you know, during the break, someone asked, could you get the model to give, you know, bursts of variable duration? I'm not sure you could. So, I mean, I, I don't mean to imply by any means that this is capable of mimicking everything that a real neuron could do, but it's, uh, it's a long, you know, it's a lot richer than a sim simple integrate and fire or Hodgkin-Huxley model with standard parameters can do anyway. So it's, um, anyway, it's, it's, it's working toward this axis from simple towards more complex uh, in the interest of finding more accurate descriptions of, uh, of spike timing data. Okay, any questions about, about first part? Yes, I'll try to repeat questions, yeah. MLE is never great. I mean, so I should say, MLE is not going to be great when you have strong correlations in your regressors. So if I have two regressors that are very similar, right? Their dot product is, their, uh, let's say, hand position and uh, acceleration and velocity are correlated with each other. So whenever I'm at high velocity, I'm always also at high acceleration. Let's just make that up. Um, I'll have, right, I'm trying to basically disentangle, this is a regression model, right? So ultimately what we're trying to do with the GLM is assess the degree to which, um, you know, variable A versus variable B is responsible for my spikes. Uh, all right, another example, we've, we've used GLMs, this is actually Memming's work, um, to try to model decision making. So uh, decision making, neurons in area LIP are um, sort of midway between sensory and motor. And you might imagine that from trial to trial, um, you know, there's, there's, there's sometimes the spikes, let's say there's a sensory variable and there's a motor output variable. And you would try to use a GLM to disentangle, this is what we did in his paper, to try to ask whether the spiking of a particular neuron was more correlated with the time that the stimulus came on or more correlated with the time that the response came on, uh, that the response was made. And so because we had a design where the stimulus and the response had variable delays relative to each other, we could dissociate the degree to which any particular pattern of spiking was time locked uh, to the response versus time locked to the onset of the stimulus. And you could find components of both in most neurons. However, if the, if the response was always time locked uh, to, the, to the stimulus, you would lose the, these would be highly correlated, and so you'd lose the ability to determine them, um, to distinguish between them. So that's where, so if they're perfectly correlated, there's almost nothing you can do. But uh, the main estimator that I'll talk about in a few slides is the, ba um, the MAP estimator, maximum a posteriori estimator, which is one where we're gonna add priors to try to regularize our estimate. And these, these are very important, especially in high dimensional settings where we, if we're working with images as our inputs, um, often we're estimating a large number of coefficients and if, so if we have a limited data set. Um, actually, the MLE is optimal asymptotically. It's almost never optimal in, from short data sets, from small data sets. You can always beat it with the, for, for if we have an explicit model, the Bayes least squares estimator would be the one that comes closest uh, in a mean squared sense to the true parameters. And that's the mean of the posterior over the parameters. But I haven't really talked about that yet, so. Um, but yeah, certainly MLE, I'm emphasizing because it's what this, this the standard logistic regression would be compute the maximum likelihood estimate of my regression parameters, but we know there are some problems with that. Yes? <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, abs absolutely not. I mean, I, say, I think we could make a loose approximation for the, um, for the strongly, um, let's see, this isn't working. That's the wrong pointer. Duh. Sorry, I don't know which pointer goes with which device. 
Um, sorry, so the question was about whether we can map the post spike filter, the parameters that determine how past spikes influence the future probability of spiking onto um, biophysical parameters. So yeah, we had this one that was bursting neuron um, where it has this biphasic shape. I would say it'd be very hard, I mean, I don't know enough biophysics to know. I would say in, the, in this first case that we had of um, either the regular spiking or the, uh, maybe this one, the adapting neuron, um, it is known that there are like after hyperpolarizing currents, so AHP currents that turn on after spiking and that do hyperpolarize the neuron. And so that, if you thought of the membrane potential, remember the interpretation that I said was that the stimulus filter output plus the post spike history filter output could be thought of as the membrane potential, then you could think of, yeah, I mean, you could maybe map this onto an AHP current. Um, and I think Wolfram Gerstner has done a lot of work to sort of show that um, these integrate and fire like neurons can actually accurately track the membrane potential measured intracellularly. So they've, they've fiddled, worked on fitting these models to intracellular data. Um, but I would, I would hesitate to, to put too much effort into that. I would say that, that in general, I mean, this is still a statistical model. We might then ask what's, what's giving rise to the bursting and is it something that has sort of a time signature like this? Um, That's right. That's right. Yeah. In fact, in fact, yeah. We can't even. I mean, that's a that's a great point. We, in fact, this kind of adaptation that I'm showing you here, I'm modeling this as due to past spiking of the same neuron. But it might be that you have adaptation during due to network effects. So we can't. In fact, this is a regret. It's 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 just a regression model. I should I should harp on that. It's just taking what you have given it and trying to predict what the response will be. So if the true mechanism is a network phenomenon that other neurons are inhibiting you once they, they all start firing and then inhibitory neurons feed back and suppress you. Um, it's still the case that your own past spikes are predictive of reductions in firing. So this model will try to attribute your reduction in firing after early spiking to a direct filter that couples your own post-spike history to your current probability of spiking. Even though biophysically, it would be your past spiking excited some inhibitory neurons which are now feeding back onto you. So, so yeah. I, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, this gets back to my early slide about this is sort of sitting at, at the level of statistical description, and it would be very interesting, I think it's separate, though, from this kind of work, is to try to now take those parameters that we got out and ask how do they map onto the biology. Yeah. So it's, it's useful for telling us what the code is, right? So I can answer the question was, what is it, what's, what good is it? It tells us what, it can tell us something about the code. So one thing we can do is we can decode, on, we can basically um, model the responses with a model that, that predicts the spine spike timing and compare it to a model that just uh, doesn't, has some sort of Poisson-like statistics. And if we can decode, we'll talk about decoding in a little bit, um, then we can make c conclusions about the ways in which information is carried. Uh, in, 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 so basically, if I interpret the spikes under a model that interprets m meaningful spike timing differences, and then I'm able to read out the stimulus better than I am in a model that takes it as a, as a Poisson rate code. Um, similarly, for, in fact, I'll show you an example with a network, network of, of neurons, where if we, we incorporate correlations between neurons, we can decode better than if we didn't. So, um, so I would say it's at the level of figuring out what's being represented by the neurons and the form of that representation. Could I, when I test a model, which is a spike count code in 100 millisecond bins versus a model of time varying spike trains, um, this is going to allow me to, to get at that question of where, where the information lives. And if I have other ideas, maybe I think it's a latency code or a bursting code, I can formulate models that will do that as well. And I can decode under those different models and ask, um, ask how much information is carried. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for those questions. Um, let's, let's move on then from single neurons to multiple neurons. Okay. So, um, so of course, one of the exciting things about modern neuroscience is the ability to record from large populations of neurons simultaneously. And the most straightforward way to generalize this model to populations of neurons would be just to fit a separate GLM to every neuron, right? So we have, um, you know, this is one Poisson generalized linear model with feedback that has its own stimulus filter. Let's say it's a, it's a spatial filter, uh, has space and time involved, and it has some post spike filter that determines its, its refractory pro properties. And I would have another filter for neuron two, um, possibly with different feedback properties. And so already I can begin to model some aspects of what might be correlated spiking that these two neurons emit due to correlations in their stimulus filter. So if these two filters are, um, have some degree of correlation between them, 
Then when I present a stimulus, the two neurons will be driven in similar ways, and I'll get a marginal correlation between the two neuron spikes. However, um, this model, in the absence of a stimulus, so if I turn off the stimulus, and I still observe correlations between the spikes, this model has no ability to capture that. So, so spiking in each neuron is con conditionally independent given the stimulus. Um, and we know that there are, in fact, noise correlations. So if I measure V1 neurons even in the dark when there's no stimulus on, on the screen, they still have strong, uh, strong correlations in their spike counts or in their spike times. And so we can actually take this idea of the post-spike filter and extend it straightforwardly to a model that also captures dependencies between neurons. So we're going to add these coupling filters, which behave exactly the same as the, as the post-spike filters, except the, um, the influences into the adjacent neurons. So every time I get a spike out of this neuron, I inject this post-spike filter, think of that as a waveform, that influences the, this neuron's own future probability of spiking, but I also inject a current into this neuron that affects its uh, future probability of spiking. And this is, this is uh, symmetrical, so th this, this waveform here would indicate how neuron two, spikes in neuron two, influence the probability of firing in neuron one in the future. And I should say these don't have to be symmetric, right? So we could have one of these coupling terms could be negative, uh, if one of them is an inhibitory neuron and the other one is positive. So unlike things like the Ising model, where they're symmetric, they're either both inhibit inhibiting each other or they're both exciting each other with equal strength, you can have different shapes, different latencies, different signs of the interactions. And the idea is that by fitting this model to data, we can pull out those, um, those statistical relationships. All right, so, <clears throat> so you look at this model, and this looks like a model, a kind of circuit diagram model that you might see a physiologist draw. Um, in fact, I was giving a talk about this one time, and, and Mike Jordan, who's a, a famous statistician, um, was hearing my talk, and he said, well, I don't think that's a GLM. You've got all these sort of feedback terms. It doesn't look like a GLM anymore. And, um, and so I, I want to just unpack, unwrap this, this diagram for you to show you that it is still a, 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 a GLM. So in fact, what I'm going to do, the relevant terms for each GLM, each neuron is a GLM, I should say, under this, this setup. Um, what I'm going to do is unwrap the diagram so that I pull out the, all of the filters that are influencing neuron one. So that is the stimulus filter for neuron one, the post-spike filter for neuron one, and the coupling filter coming into neuron one from neuron two. If I do it, I have the following kind of diagram, which is, right, the stimulus is some, um, some binary sequence that goes back in time, and I'm going to take a dot product of the stimulus filter with the current time bin of the stimulus. I also have the neuron's own spike history, and I have some history filter here that I'll take a dot product of that history filter with the current spike history. And then the spikes of neuron two are gonna feed into this coupling filter from neuron two to neuron one. These three dot products get added up, passed through a single nonlinearity, and then they predict the output of that nonlinearity is the instantaneous firing rate for that neuron in that, uh, in that time bin, okay? So this is the exact same model. I've just taken this model and unwrapped it to show you that it really is just a regression problem. I'm trying to ask what predicts spiking in this, in this time bin? What degree can I linearly weight these spikes, these spikes, and this stimulus in order to predict uh, this, this spiking in this bin? And of course, if I get zero weights out here, that would be an indication that um, that, that neuron doesn't have any predictive information about what spiking will occur. Um, I've written in the bottom here is the formula for the firing rate of the ith neuron. The instantaneous firing rate is now given by the stimulus term, that's the dot product between K1 and the stimulus, plus this sum over all of the net incoming uh, spike coupling uh, terms. So if you go back to this diagram, you can actually see that this is a pair of GLMs. There's one GLM that's being fit to, the, to predict the spike train of neuron one using a bunch of regressors, where those regressors include the stimulus and whatever spike trains I want to throw into it. Um, and then there's another GLM that's predicting the spike train of neuron two. And it again has regressors that will be, it just so happens that some of the regressors for neuron two are the past spikes of neuron one. But I could have used other things. In fact, there's work from, um, from Rob Cass where they use LFP. Um, other, other kinds of signals that we might measure could be used as regressors here as well. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the multi-neuron GLM. And I wanted to talk about fitting next. Um, how do we actually fit the model to data? So this gets to the, to the question. Um, well, so actually, I think what's useful to do here, I'm going to show you some figures that pop up out of the, the um, tutorial that I posted before the break. I don't know how many people, mostly probably, you, hopefully you, you took a chance to get some coffee and, and take a break instead of launching MATLAB right away. This is, this is a, a tutorial written in MATLAB, and there's a Python version floating around, which is not complete yet, but I, I hope to complete it sometime. Um, sometime in the next couple of months. Um, I wanted to show you what comes out of that tutorial. So this is an example of the, um, of the data set that's used. So the stimulus is plotted here. This is one second of the stimulus. It's full field flicker. 
So the stimulus is either minus 0.48 or, or, point, or plus 0.48, and it, it's, by, it's Bernoulli drawn from a, uh, from a Bernoulli distribution with probably 0.5 of being positive or negative in each time bin. Okay, so the stimulus, the whole screen is flickering white and dark, white and dark, and these are the spike times of a single retinal ganglion cell measured in fine time bins. If we bin those spike times at the same resolution as the stimulus here, we have these binned counts here, which now have some bins have up to three spikes in them. And I wanted to show you now what I talked before about building the design matrix. So this code will show you a, fa a fast trick for building the design matrix. Remember, to build the design matrix, we're going to take every chunk of stimulus here that's relevant pr for predicting a single time bin of the output spike train here and take that relevant vector and put it on one row of the design matrix. So that's what that looks like. Here's the design matrix constructed from that pass. This gray triangle here are the zeros prior to the start of the stimulus, and then we have positive and negative values of the stimulus. Black pixels are negative, white pixels are, are positive. And again, this has the shape of a uh, Henkel matrix, which is a Toplitz matrix flipped left to right, because each row is a shifted copy of the row above. You can see that very clearly here. And our model, the GLM that we're fitting, is trying to predict P of Y given X, where these are the spike counts. These are the, this is that vector of spike counts here, now written as a column vector, all right? So as I said before, the vast majority of the work is in actually building this design matrix. Once you have that, everything is easy. But so this is the simple GLM that we looked at earlier in the first part of the, of, uh, the lecture. Um, when we add spike history, we now have two chunks of the design matrix, right? So, um, so this now is the stimulus portion. The first, I used 25 bins of history because that was determined to be acceptable. And we, we, you have some outer loop procedure for trying different window lengths to see what works best. But then this is the spike history of that same neuron. And you can kind of see that like this is that bright spike there. It's receding into the past. So at this time bin, you're trying to predict this spike using you know, this, this spike that happened some time ago. Okay, so this, this diagonal structure is showing you your own spikes further and further back in the past. All right, so what you're effectively doing, this design matrix, you're learning a single parameter vector, which has two chunks. Part of that parameter vector would be the H filter. That's this part here. And this would be the stimulus filter. K would be this chunk here. We can go beyond, actually, in the, in the tutorial, it'll take you to an example with four neurons, and then you can build the stimulus design matrix from four different neurons. So now there are, there are five chunks to the, um, to the design matrix, a stimulus portion, the neuron's own spike history, and then neuron two, three, and four, spike history from all four of those neurons. So now the design matrix has these five blocks, which correspond to different kinds of regressors. But once you've built the design matrix, you don't care, ultimately. You can now just pipe this into GLM fit if you want, or into your own code, and try to ask, well, what linear weights should I use on this matrix followed by a nonlinearity in order to predict these spike counts here that I observed? All right, so that's a bit what the fitting problem looks like mechanically, um, and you can get these figures out of the, out of the code if, you, if you're able to run it. If you do have bugs, please send them to me, and I'd be happy to um, help diagnose. Okay, so how do we do fitting? And I said before, we, we can call GLM fit. What is GLM fit doing? It's doing something very simple. It's computing the log likelihood of the data or we could write our own function to compute the log likelihood data of the data. Here it is written out not in a as a vector matrix notation, which is a sum across time bins. It's the sum of the spike count times the log firing rate minus the, lo minus the firing rate in each time bin. You sum that up, and that's the log likelihood, okay? And, there's a, and, and so I should say, the number of parameters here is getting quite exorbitant. So in fact, the data set that I showed you earlier with um, which it, where the stimuli were spatially varying, um, each frame of the stimulus has a binary checkerboard, which is, which is uh, you know, black or white in each little, little chunk. So the stimulus filter now looks like something with dimensions of space by space by time. You're estimating this entire tensor of coefficients. And then each of the coupling filters from an adjacent neuron um, looks like one of these. We parameterize this in a smooth basis of functions to reduce the number of dimensions, but it's still got around 10 parameters for each one of these coupling parameters. So, so um, each of these coupling filters. So the, the, um, the, the maximum likelihood fitting problem is to compute this likelihood function and do gradient ascent in this hundred, several hundred dimensional parameter space, all right? So you make an initial guess of the parameters, and then you take gradients and you walk uphill until you get to a global mode. And normally it's, a, it's a, maybe a worrying thing to do to optimize a high dimensional function, uh, a nonlinear high dimensional function, but there's one nice thing about the generalized linear model is that there uh, is actually a very nice proof due to Liam Paninsky in a paper he wrote in 2004 that the log likelihood function for this model is concave, all right, subject to certain guarantees on the nonlinearity. So this comes back a little bit to questions earlier about why not 
Why use the nonlinearity of, of this form? Why not have the spike history influence it after the nonlinearity? One reason is that this property is a very nice one. Concavity of a likelihood function means that, the, um, that there are no local maxima. There are only global maxima of the likelihood. Or I should say the only local maxima are global maxima. Um, just as an aside on that, if you're not familiar with these terms, convexity and concavity, you're used to hearing about convex, convex loss functions. Um, a convex function is one that has everywhere upward curvature. So it's a bowl-shaped function. Obviously, it can't have any local, any, any sub, it can't have two separated local optima because in between them, you'd have to have a, a region of, of negative curvature. Um, and so a concave function is just the negative of a convex function. It's got everywhere downward curvature. So maximizing a concave function is the same as minimizing a convex function. You're guaranteed that no matter where you initialize, you will get to a global minimum, uh, a, a global optimum of the function. Okay, so it precludes the existence of non-global non local optima. All right, and I, should, I didn't tell you the, the technical condition. It actually turns out that this nonlinearity f for the Poisson GLM has to grow at least linearly and at most exponentially. So you can't actually have a sigmoid and still have this, this guarantee of convexity. You can still, you can use a sigmoid, but the, the point is that when you initialize, you might get stuck in a local optimum and you might have to try local, multiple, um, multiple times to optimize from dish, different initial conditions, okay? So this is one of the reasons that the GLM has been popular is that even though it's a nonlinear function, um, it can accommodate these very high dimensional parameter spaces and we don't have to resort to elaborate fitting tricks um, to, to in order to find the optimal, at least the maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, um, and I'll show you some simple, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a result from a paper that we published in 2008 where we fit the, that GLM to an entire population of ganglion cells. So this is, um, these are the receptive fields of those ganglion cells. They're numbered arbitrarily from one to 11. These are all on ganglion cells um, and they have these sort of, they like light in some central region. And on the right here are the cross correlations of all, uh, pairwise cross correlations. So each entry here, so here's the fifth cell in gray these cross correlations in gray here are the correlations between cell five and all of the other cells. Here's five with 11, five with 10, et cetera. And what you'll notice is that there are these strong peaks in the cross correlogram indicating synchronous firing uh, around with a time lag of zero. And the data are shown in this black dotted trace here. I'm sorry, the plot is a little bit small. It's hard to see. And we fit the full GLM with coupling terms in between them. And the red curve shows the cross correlations of the fitted coupled GLM. So we fit the GLM to data, then we simulate spike trains from the data, and the simulated spike trains reci reciprocate, those, reproduce those peaks, those synchrony peaks. If instead we use an uncoupled GLM, the blue model here, each neuron has only its own stimulus receptive field and post spike filter, it's still able to capture some aspect of the correlation, right? There's this sort of gentle bump, um, which is probably due to overlap in the stimulus receptive fields, but it's not able to capture this fine time scale synchrony. So these, these, they, they diverge within about plus or minus 10 milliseconds of zero. So this is a synchrony on the, on the time scale of 10 milliseconds, roughly. Do I see a question? No. Yes. That's right. That's a great question. So the question was, uh, if, 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 would it make sense if you wanted to fit a model which had a different nonlinearity than one of these allowed ones, would it make sense to initialize your fits with one of these sort of safe nonlinearities where you're guaranteed to get a global optimum and then later change the nonlinearity to some other? That's exactly what I would recommend. In fact, um, part of the code package will fit a cubic spline or some other, you can use other um, radial basis functions to parameterize your nonlinearity. And so what we would, what we typically do would be we initialize our fit to the filter parameters with an exponential nonlinearity or a rectified linear, or you can use rectified squaring. There you're in this family of, of globally log concave likelihood functions. And you know you'll get an optimum for that model. Now you can then change the nonlinearity and, and then continue ascending the likelihood. And so you don't guarantee that you'll get a global optimum that way, but you'll at least um, you, I mean, you, you often, I should say, in practice, we find that that gets very close to a, um, the global optimum if, if we then elaborately search throughout them. So, so um, yeah, the code, that, the, the code package that's on there can support other choices of nonlinearity, but I think it's generally a good idea to start with something. Often you, you converge much more quickly also when you have a convex loss function. Yeah, was there another question here? Okay, okay so this, this model, um, so this is on the encoding side uh, what we showed was that this, the, the coupled model could capture the correlation structure of the spike trains 
The uncoupled model could not. Um, I'm not showing it to you, but it turned out that these two models actually did equally well at producing a single neuron's peristimulus time histogram. So the mean firing rate in response to a repeated stimulus was equally well fit by both of these two models. And so that poses an interesting question. And I could predict firing rates um, considered independently equally well from both models, but am I gaining something by the fact that this coupled GLM is able to also capture the spike timing statistics? And, and so this gets to the question that came up a bit earlier about, well, what good is the model? Or what, 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 what are the, some of the things it can be used to do? And I'll tell you about that uh, we we'll focus on decoding in a second. Yeah, question here. We always have model mismatch. So you're absolutely right. The question is, what happens if we subsample? So we're always subsampling, right? We're recording only some, actually, I should say, here maybe we're not, because these are ganglion cells, and they're, they're in a 2D lattice. Um, so I should say, this is a, a locally complete mosaic of ganglion cells of this cell type. So there are on and off cells in this population. I'm just showing you the on cells here. The off cells were also a complete mosaic. But certainly in cortex, we're massively under, undersampling. So I don't mean to suggest these coupling terms should not be interpreted as, as anatomical connectivity. The term that often gets used is functional connectivity. I should say, the GLM actually maps, if you're familiar with the concept of Granger causality, um, it's exactly, G Granger causality is also, comes from a GLM. I'm asking, how well can I predict the response in one time bin using the past from another neuron? And so there's no claim that this is, that I should say, it's easy to have scenarios where we find a coupling filter from neuron A to neuron B, but A influences neuron C, which influences neuron B. Or let's say C influences A and B with, a, with some time lag. So that, that one is um, C influences A on a, t on a fast time scale, um, and it influences B on a later time scale. B can learn, you can predict spikes in B by looking at the spikes from A. That's all the GLM is telling us. It's telling us about prediction, about when we can pr what we can use to predict the spikes of each neuron. Um, and so some neuron spikes are relevant to that and some are, some are not. And so this, I would say this is similar to the question of biophysics. Um, Mapping functional connectivity onto anatomical connectivity is not something that comes for free. It's something we can, we can try to do. Often we have outside information about what kinds of, um, kinds of connections there are. Another point is that actually the strength of the, you can often relate the strength of the coupling filter and its lag. So I should say the, the coupling filters that we got out here have zero, um, have zero time lag, which is inconsistent with a synaptic delay. So if you, if you thought that you had monosynaptic connections, it might well be possible to take the GLM the fitted coupling filters and interpret them, make an inference about anatomical connectivity, but you need extra assumptions. It's not, you, can't, you can't do that for free. Okay. Yeah, this is aiming at a statistical model of the responses, not at a, uh, a picture of their, of their anatomical connectome. Okay, but let's, let's ask what we can do with the model now. So another thing that we haven't talked about yet is we can take the model um, and we can use it to do decoding. So first, let me just motivate the idea of decoding. So, so far, we've been trying to predict y from x. We've been fitting a model that, that specifies the conditional probability of y from x. Now, the, the decoding problem is to go in the opposite direction. Given some spike trains here, let's say I showed you these spikes, but I don't tell you what the stimulus was in this window. Can you tell me what the likely pattern of light was during this time window here? So estimate from the, the stimuli from the observed spike times. So just to let you see what that looks like, I'll let you guys be the decoder. You be the, you be the brain. This is, in some sense, the task the brain has to solve. The brain gets retinal spikes and it has to interpret those spikes in order to figure out what was out in the world. Now, it doesn't literally reconstruct the pattern of pixels on the retina, but it does have to make inferences about that missing, that missing stimulus. So I'll show you the spiking output of the retina in response to a very simple stimulus. So this is a paper from E.J. Chichelnitsky's lab, Frechette et al., 2005. Um, watch the screen and see if you can tell what the stimulus was. Each little square here is a spike from a single neuron. Okay, so what do you see? I see people going like this. Yes, so this is, um, looks like a drifting bar to the right. How about now? Okay, so now you can see a drifting bar going in the opposite direction. These data were, in fact, collected from a, um, from a stimulus in which a, a light bar was drifted across the population in one direction and then in the other direction. It's worth pointing out that if you didn't know which neurons were which, if I just showed you this raster of responses, it's fairly hopeless to try to reconstruct what the stimulus was. But I was able, you were able to use your visual system to watch the incoming spikes in order to decode what the stimulus was um, that generated those two movies. All right? Okay, so in this particular context, what we're going to focus on is Bayesian decoding, where we use an encoding model, 
right? So we fit already p of y given x. We're gonna use an encoding model to basically solve this decoding problem. So let me describe how we do that. So Bayes' rule specifies the posterior over the stimulus here is proportional to the conditional probability of y given x. That's the likelihood in x now. This is what you might call the, the stimulus likelihood. Um, and this is what our model produces. It produces for any x, it gives us the probability of a spike count y. And times the prior over x. So in this case, the prior over x is not very interesting. It's just uh, Bernoulli prob independent probability of being up or down from this stimulus window here. Um, but the interesting thing that we can do is we can plug in different models for this, um, for this, this likelihood here, right? So the likelihood, we can either use one from the uncoupled GLM, where each neuron is modeled conditionally dependent only on the stimulus. So, right, the, so the net probability of all the spike responses is just the probability of spike train one times the probability of spike train two times up to the nth neuron is the product of the probabilities from each neuron versus the coupled GLM, in which case these don't factorize in the same way. We now have a joint distribution over all of the spike, uh, spike trains because each neuron is coupled to the, the history of its neighbors. And what we found in this paper, we were able to do stimulus reconstruction and quantify it in terms of the log signal to noise ratio. Um, and we found that there was a, approximately 20% increase in information when, with the, the GLM fit with coupling terms compared to a model without coupling. And both of these Bayesian decoders were better than a straight up linear decoder that just tried to map, basically solve the linear GLM in the opposite direction, mapping spike response words to the stimulus intensity, all right? So, um, so what this says is that, that the, the spike timing information that we were able to, the correlations present in the spike trains um, were, allowed us to decode better than if we had ignored those correlations, a model that only treated each neuron as having uh, 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 independent, independent noise uh, relative to the others. I mean, the way I think about this is there's a kind of explaining away effect with the coupling term. So if I see, in the, under the coupled model, when I see a spike from this neuron, well, let me start with the uncoupled model. When I see a, when the uncoupled model, if I see spikes from this neuron, I can only interpret that in terms of some pattern of light on, this, on, this, on the retina. Um, on the other hand, in the coupled neuron, I might interpret, uh, when I see a spike from this neuron, I could either see, think that might be related to the light on the, on the screen, light on the retina, or it might be related to something in the spike history of a neighboring neuron. So, so it, it basically allows you to, to better attribute the spikes that you observe to, to as associate them with either influences of the stimulus or with influences of past spiking of other neurons. And again, that's not causal influence of past spiking, statistical spiking past, you know. We know that if these two neurons regularly spike together, then the spike of, of neuron two following a spike from neuron one is probably due to that coupling, not due to, uh, to light, a pattern of light. Okay, so that's one of the kinds of things we can do with the model. Um, <clears throat> I'd now, now like to mention, um, this is, uh, is uh, a rough segue, we could put this in anywhere, but I want to mention the topic of regularization, all right? Um, so I've assumed it so far that we have a lot of data, so we have, a, although we have many hundreds of parameters, we have thousands or tens of thousands of, sam of time bins in our experiment, but in many cases that's not the case. So in particular, um, in many kinds of data sets that we might wish to analyze, fMRI is one that comes to mind. Um, the Ys, the neural responses, are very, very high dimensional. So you could think of, um, I should, sorry, let's, let's not use, Let's not use fMRI, because I'm thinking of fMRI decoding, sorry. Um, we're, in many settings, we might have trial-based data, where we have many, many regressors, uh, more regressors than we have, have trials. So in that case, um, we have the dimensionality, this, this um, design matrix here is a short and fat matrix. What I assumed before was that it was a tall, skinny matrix. We had more uh, total regressors, more observations than we had dimensions. But modern statistics in particular has focused on this setting, where let's say I have 10,000 parameters that I'm trying to learn, so D different regressors. Let's say, especially if I have a large population of neurons, I might want to learn coupling to every other neuron in the population. That rapidly explodes the number of parameters I'm trying to estimate. And if I have a small data set, um, then I'll be trying to learn D parameters from only N observations. So as a linear system, the, the least square solution won't even exist. So there are fewer equations than there are unknowns, and there's no unique solution um, to this problem, partly because they're multiply linearly um, these, these, these columns of this matrix are linearly de dependent with each other. Um, so, the, so, yes? Oh, sorry. Yes. These columns of this matrix are linearly dependent, so there are multiple ways to combine these to get the same prediction, Y is one way to think about it. So W, I'm using W here for the decoding weights. This is what we call theta or K uh, on other slides. Okay, so what do we do in this setting? Here's a, here's a simulated example that I made. I made a sample where there was a, 
100 element filter, so D is equal to 100, um, and there are also only 100 time bins of the response. So the, the design matrix is square, 100 by 100. The true weight vector that I used was this W here. It's, it looks like a difference of Gaussians. And when I compute the maximum likelihood estimate, that's this X transpose X inverse times X transpose Y. That's the formula I gave you before. The estimate that pops out is this, this red trace here, right? It's very noisy. It has lots of, um, doesn't look like a very good estimate of, uh, of, of W here. I should say in this case, the, the, uh, the noises, the stimuli themselves were also correlated. So they had low power at high frequencies. And so the estimate is, is uh, badly corrupted by, um, by noise here. Yes? Okay, so the question was why keep the model complexity up and use regularization? Why not just reduce model complexity? So those two things are synonyms. Redu regularization means reducing model complexity, all right? So that's what I mean. Regularization is a, is a technique for, for re restricting, sorry, I should say, there's a Bayesian interpretation to regularization, which is as a prior on the parameters. And the pr that prior will restrict the degrees of freedom of the model. So in, in, in practice, I'll tell you about two priors in a second here. But it's ex exactly equivalent to minimizing model complexity. You can think of the volume of the prior as the model complexity. Um, and so in the limit of um, a totally flat prior, the, the parameters can live anywhere in that entire space. If I make a prior that says, hey, a Gaussian centered at zero, I start to restrict the possible settings of my model parameters and say the parameters have to be closer and closer to zero. If I make my prior a delta function at zero, then my maximum posti a posteriori estimate will also be all zeros. So I'll have, I'll have no model complexity at all, and I won't be able to fit my data. So, so regularization is absolutely, uh, I, uh, in my view at least, identical to reducing model complexity. I mean, there are other, if you're thinking about dropping regressors, that's another way of reducing model complexity, and there, there are priors that will allow you to drop, the lasso prior is what I'm not gonna talk about, that will shrink out um, certain regressors. There's also something called subset selection, which will allow you to, to select certain regressors to keep in the model and discard others. So those are all forms of regularization that are tantamount to restricting model complexity. Okay. Okay, so this is, the, this is again the maximum likelihood estimate for this, um, this example. And I should say, if I only had one less sample, if I had 99 samples and we still had t t 100 dimensions, I wouldn't get anything out of my maximum likelihood formula. It would say, I cannot invert this matrix. It's not invertible. Okay, but if we, instead of computing the maximum likelihood estimate, we actually, um, uh, here's one way to think about it. We had a penalty on the sum of the squared weights. So Wi is the ith element of this weight vector here. We're gonna not just maximize the log likelihood, the log probability of the data given the, given the weight vector. We're also gonna attach a penalty. Um, so we're gonna maximize lam this, this log likelihood minus um, lambda times this sum of squares. All right, so, so if, if W has all of these large values out here, we, this, this penalty term would be larger. And so in fact, the optimal estimate under this, um, this model here ends up looking a lot better, right? So we, these, these large fluctuations out in the tails here have largely gone away. For this particular prior, one nice thing is that it still has a closed form solution. So in fact, X transpose X, you can add lambda, lambda times the identity matrix to that, to that um, this, this design matrix transposed with itself. And you'll notice that it's, this is always well conditioned now. We worried about X, the columns of X being linearly dependent. We've now added a diagonal matrix, lambda times the identity. So this matrix will always have, be full rank, once we, well, assu assuming lambda is, um, you know, is, not, is not too small. So this inverse is now well defined and we get, a, um, we get an estimate that behaves well. So this is a penalty on weights and I, I don't have it in the slides. You can also interpret this penalty as a log prior. So this is the, this first term, where are we? I lost my, this first term is the log likelihood. The second term we can interpret as the log prior. So if I formulate, a, I should say, if I formulate a prior, which is zero mean Gaussian prior on these weights with variance related to, la, to lambda here, then this is, the, this is the log prior plus the log um, likelihood gives me something proportional to the log, uh, the log posterior. So maximizing this quantity is the same as finding the maximum of the posterior over the parameters under this likelihood and this prior. 
Okay, there's actually some nice theoretical work. Um, James and Stein proved that, that this, uh, this gives us a biased estimator now. So it's no longer the case that, that um, so in, you're shrinking, there's another name for this is shrinkage. You're shrinking your estimate towards zero. And even though this is biased, it actually improves the performance um, for appropriate choices of lambda. And we'll have, we'll have smaller error. You can see obviously that the error between the true W and the estimated W here with the ridge prior is better um, than it is for the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, in practice, how do we set this? I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Here's another prior we could use would be a smoothness penalty or a smoothness prior, which is instead of saying each weight came from a zero mean Gaussian prior, we're going to say the differences between pairs of adjacent weights, those differences came from a zero mean Gaussian prior. So instead, I'll penalize wi minus wi minus 1. This sum of squares of this is the quantity that I'll try to minimize. And again, lambda is the amount that I pay attention to this smoothness penalty compared to the log likelihood. And you see that the smooth estimate is actually much better now um, than the, even the, the ridge regression estimate, right? These, these coefficients were shrunk down towards zero, but they weren't made smoother. Um, with the smoothness penalty, they now uh, start to come much closer to this true W that was, that was smooth. So I should say one of the names of the game in fitting GLMs, uh, in addition to formulating better models of P of Y given X, better mo mappings from stimuli to responses, another um, area that, that my lab has worked on and many others have as well, is formulating better priors over neural receptive fields. So there's certain things we know about receptive fields. They tend to be smooth across space, smooth across time. They tend to be restricted in their frequency content. They tend to be restricted in their spatial extent as well. And so by building more, um, more flexible priors that take that into account, we can get much better estimates from less data. So that's an area of active research, but I'm not going to could do a whole talk on that, but I'll, I'll stop there now. Yes, yeah, a couple questions, though. Why would you want to have small weights? Um, I guess I, th I think the way I would, I would frame it is in it's, it goes back to this question over here about model complexity. So it's not necessarily, I mean, the remarkable thing about the James and Stein paper is that they show that it's not actually necessarily about having them small. You could actually, sh in, in the general version, you could shrink them towards any location in the 3D volume and you would, still, um, you would still improve. So it's basically shrinking the volume of the parameter space that it's allowed to extend over. So when I, when I don't have a prior, my weight vector can go anywhere in the space, in that, that whole high d-dimensional space. And so I'm, I'm restricting them to, to keep them from varying too much. I guess, um, why near zero? I guess, I guess in the absence of good data. So, so one thing that makes sense is if my likelihood becomes total garbage. Let's say I have a, a huge amounts of noise in the likelihood. I take um, my stimulus filter, I convolve it with my stimulus, and then I add Gaussian noise of variance a million. Um, I'll have such a weak signal that trying to estimate the weights from that signal gives me garbage, pure garbage. And in that case, my best prediction would come from shrinking all my weights to zero and say, just predict the mean at zero. Don't try to follow the wiggles of the data. So in some sense, um, what happens is as, as you get better and better, as you get worse and worse data, the weights closer to zero will give you better prediction performance as well. So you can actually justify this with just, I should, I, I, didn't, I think it's on there. How do we set the reg regularization strength? Let me say this and then we'll, and I'll take more questions. How do we set this hyperparameter, lambda here, um, right, so if we set this to be too big, we'll make these too smooth. We'll eventually get something that's flat. If we set it too weak, we'll, we'll be left with the maximum likelihood estimate. So as a smoothly varying this regularization parameter, lambda, we'll get different behavior in between all zeros and the, um, and, and the maximum likelihood solution. And the simple procedure for this is to use cross-validation. So use some of your data, set aside 80% of your data, um, train your weights with a particular setting of lambda, um, and then use, the rem then use the fitted weights to predict the, the held out 20% of the data. Do that for all different values, a grid of different lambda values, and take the one that maximized the prediction performance. Um, you know, that one, that, that, that will sort of agree with this intuition that smaller weights when you have noisy data make, make smaller errors. You don't want to try to predict, uh, make large predictions when your data are too noisy. So um, there are other ways to set lambda that I won't talk about, but that's, um, that's what's in the code. I should say this is, this, these slides were designed around the, tu this, the MATLAB tutorial that I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll post these slides in case someone wants to download them. But it will do a grid search over these different lambda values and pick out the, it'll, it'll divide your data into training and test, 
and then it will use a grid of different lambda values, compute the optimum for each one, and then select the best one. I should say, this, I, I added this only recently to this tutorial because this is something I used to never cover, and in, in practical settings, it matters hugely. So the, the theory sounds all really nice. We take the maximum likelihood estimator. But if your inputs are natural sounds or natural, natural images, they always have correlations, and the maximum likelihood estimators you get out will be garbage. So this is actually really critical to the practical implementation of GLMs, is thinking about regularization. Only if you happen to have Gaussian white noise stimuli can you probably get away, or, or strongly uncorrelated stimuli, can you get away with not regularizing. Okay, I'll end my, my sermon there. Yeah, uh, other questions about, yes? Can I stop you right there? So you said you said better pr um, better performance for decoding. We're getting better pr performance for encoding here. So we're we're trying to penalize the weights so that when we use those weights to predict new spike responses, that's we're trying to predict the, the encoding. Not, we're not doing decoding. We, we, you could instead try to do that, but that's not what that's not what this is. We're trying to predict new responses y from x's in the training in the, in the held out test set. Sorry, to keep going. Or, then this makes sense. Okay. I mean, I've never heard of anyone. Setting the regularization based on decoding, I don't see any reason you couldn't though, right? Let's say you wanted, in fact, it's, not, it's conceivable that those two wouldn't always agree perfectly. The best weights for predicting new spike responses might actually suck when you try to use them for decoding the stimulus. That's a great point. I don't see any reason you couldn't do that. I hadn't thought of that before, but that's a, nice, that's a nice idea. Yeah, I mean, typically what we'll have is we'll have two families of models. So we'll have the coupled model and the uncoupled model, and we need to regularize them. So I didn't tell you about the regularization that I did for the, the coupled model, but I actually use an L1 penalty, which will drive the unneeded coupling parameters all the way to zero. So it ends up being not all to all connected. It ends up having only a subset of the connections, mostly only nearest neighbor connections. So we, we, we set that, we basically learn that optimal sparsity by varying lambda, and we do, do that trying to predict held out spikes. So we're, we, we, we set that lambda to do optimal encoding. We now have two encoding models that were set based on encoding, and then we compare those two, data, those two models on decoding performance, and we saw that the coupled model was better. But you're right, that if, it, if we'd gotten a different answer, that would be quite interesting. If we instead had used our held out set to do decoding and set lambda based on that, we, we could, in theory, get a different answer. So that's a, that's a nice idea. So, so, sorry, you're asking about other, other ways of assessing goodness of fit? Yes. I mean, here I'm comparing a continuum of models, is the way I would say this. There's a continuum of models defined by this different settings of lambda. For each lambda, I'll get a different estimate of the weights, and I want to find the optimum in that space of lambdas. Um, So you can't actually do AIC here because you have penalized estimator now. So AIC is a, I, I believe anyway, maybe there's some way to adapt it to map estimators. But I believe with AIC, you're supposed to take maximum likelihood estimators from di models with different number of, of parameters possibly, penalize them based on the number of parameters. There are, there are altered, there are other, other model comparison metrics like the DIC or WAIC that will let you use, use Bayesian. Uh, That's right. What's the quality? There's no one good fitness of t uh, good, goodness of fit test. I, I would say, uh, yeah, the general answer would be, I'm not at all attached to using cross-validation to set lambda. So the Bayesian way to do it is to integrate out the weights and find the, the, the hyperparameter that maximizes what's called the marginal likelihood, the probability of the data just given the hyperparameter. So it turns out in the Gaussian model, you can do that. You can integrate over W. So you can say, of all the weights consistent with this prior, where the prior is defined by lambda, what's, how, how, uh, how likely are the data? And I can, opti I can maximize that likelihood. This is often known as type two maximum likelihood or evidence optimization. That's what we tend to use a lot in my lab, but it's a little bit more hairy to work through. But if you had some other goodness of fit metric that you wanted to use to set lambda, I don't see any, in principle, any objection. You Great. Okay, so um, 
Any other questions? OK, so, so, so now is where I actually had in the slides. This is the, um, this is the slide that mentions the tutorials. The last two tutorials are about regularization. So I, I separated these out partly because for the linear Gaussian model, both of the priors that I just described to you can be the, the map estimate, the maximum a posteriori estimate, the one that minimizes this sum of log likelihood and log prior, can be available in closed form. So the ridge regression is the one where we just penalize the size of the weights, and I'll call the smoothing, a smoothing prior, it's also known as the graph Laplacian, if we penalize the squared differences between adjacent weights. These two are very easy to, um, the, the closed form solution to the weights under, under these two priors. So this is under the linear Gaussian model, and then under the um, Poisson GLM, you actually have to do a, a numerical optimization for each setting of lambda. So it's a little bit harder to do this, but um, it does that in that script there. So anyway, those are available if you'd like to, to test them out. Okay, so we're basically done with GLM. Um, so just to summarize, we said the GLM is, this is the notion of a GLM, it's a linear model followed by a point nonlinearity followed by noise. It can incorporate spike history via these history filters. It can give rise to interesting dynamical properties such as refractoriness and bursting. Um, we saw that it could incorporate correlations between neurons via these coupling filters, and that we can use it for both encoding and decoding. And lastly, we mentioned regularization, which often gets short shrift, but is actually key to making these, these models work in practice, especially when we have a large number of regressors that we want to fit the model to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about alternatives to the GLM. I said, let's call this beyond GLM. Um, oh, any questions before we, before we move on? Yeah. Ah. Yes, so that's one reason to do maximum marginal likelihood is because you can take gradients of the hyperparam. So yeah, so, so gridding, cross-validation to set that lambda works if I only have one hyperparameter. I can, I can set a grid of values and, and compute the optimum at each one. But if I have two, then I have a 2D grid. You know, it gets expensive when I have n hyperparameters. And so there are other, there are a variety of methods. So you can actually take the gradient of the, the law of the test likelihood with respect to those hyperparameters. That's another, uh, you, you can try to do local search for those using the, the test likelihood. Um, you can also use empirical Bayes and take derivatives with, with respect to the marginal likelihood. But, but you're right, the, the naive gridding solution doesn't, it begins to not look very appealing. And in fact, we often want to do that. So we might want to regularize the coupling parameters between neurons differently than we regularize the filter. The filter is operating on the stimulus, which has these strong correlations. So it needs strong smoothing, but the coupling filters maybe have some other kind of structure that they, that they need different, different strength regularizers as well. Yeah, so that certainly comes up. Okay, so the first model, um, I'll mention this one more for historical reasons. It actually came around um, before the GLM, is um, instead of modeling the response with a single linear projection followed by a point nonlinearity, another idea would be to try to fit a polynomial to the input-output function. And so that brings up the idea of the Volterra or Wiener kernel models. And effectively, these are just Taylor series expansions of a multidimensional function. So you're familiar with the standard Taylor series expansion. You have a function which is, equal, is approximately equal to a constant plus a linear function plus a quadratic plus a cubic, et cetera. You can expand to whatever order you want, and usually as you add orders, you get, you get better and better performance. In, um, for, for a multivariate function, so if I have, I have n inputs, let's say I have a 20-dimensional stimulus vector that comes in. Um, so the mapping from, is from 20-dimensional input space to a one-dimensional output space. Then the analogous thing is an expansion that looks like this. Um, y equals f of x can be approximated by a constant plus a linear function. This is a dot product between k1. So this is a constant. This is a dot product between a vector and the stimulus. Then a quadratic form. So this is a matrix with n squared coefficients that you hit on either side with the stimulus vector, plus a third order tensor that you would hit kind of if you can think of hitting that tensor with the stimulus from either side. This will give you terms that look like x cubed, this will have terms like x squared, this is terms like x. All right, and you can keep going up to fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera, order. And this is the Volterra or the Wiener kernel expansion. Um, this model actually comes out of the, uh, let's see, oh, so I should say, one, one drawback of this model, of course, is that the number of parameters goes up very quickly with order. So if n is 20, there are 20 elements in the stimulus vector x, that's the, the window of t history that I'm looking over, um, then I have 20 parameters in the, in the filter, in the, in the linear term, 20 squared in this second order term, 20 cubed in the third order. So right, it, it, it goes very rapidly. 
Um, this model actually comes out of the systems identification literature in the, in, uh, in the engineer, electrical engineering um, field. And often these models were used with white noise stimuli. So as, as I said before, this dates back to an era when people would often tailor their stimulus selection to the fact that it would make your model easy to estimate. So these, these happen to have a nice property that you can estimate the parameters. That's K0, K1, K2, et cetera, just using the moments of the spike-triggered stimuli. So effectively, you collect all the spikes that you observed, and you grab those stimuli that elicited those spikes, and you now average them to get K1. That's the spike-triggered average. You take the sum of their outer products, that's the spike-triggered covariance matrix, to get the K2, their, their triplet sort of outer product to make a, a third-order tensor to get this, this parameter here. Okay, so, so these models are very easy to fit to data, um, but they're very l data limited in that it's in practice it's very hard to go beyond second order just because of the number of parameters. You start to get worse fits as you add higher order terms. Okay, um, now not to bag on these too much, but these models have largely fallen out of favor, and, and why is that? So why do they generally, um, why do they generally not perform well? I would argue that, that part of the reason they don't do very well is that the idea of fitting a polynomial to your input-output function describing what a neuron does misses the fact that neurons have certain canonical kinds of nonlinearities. So effectively, if we looked even just at a one-dimensional um, one neuron, neurons tend to have nonlinearities that look like this black trace. So this is a simulated neuron that I fit, um, I used, I fit a second-order uh, Volterra model to. Um, the true nonlinearity is this sort of sigmoidal-looking curve here. The first-order Wiener kernel looks like a, linear, a purely linear model that just has this red curve. The second order one fits a quadratic to it, so it's this green curve. And as you can see, that's a, that's a function that will still go to infinity as you go further and out on the stimulus axis. Um, third order uh, Volterra model would start to capture this knee shape a bit better, but again, it would go off to negative infinity on this side and off to positive infinity on this side. So, um, so from that standpoint, the idea of just expanding your function as a, as a polynomial in the high dimensional space has not worked out very well and you largely with the exception of some sort of kernelized Volterra kernels, you mostly don't see these, um, these methods used as much anymore. But this is another idea, and it, it takes us beyond, um, beyond the GLM, which is only a single linear projection. You now have all second order, sec all, second order um, all quadratic terms, all cubic terms, et cetera, as you go to higher and higher orders. Okay, so that's the Volterra model, or the Wiener model. Um, another alternative is to go beyond, so I should say, we talked about and this, this largely reflects the way we build new models, is we think about what's wrong with the existing model and ask, well, what could we add to it to, to fix up what was wrong? So when we went from the, the standard GLM with no spike history, the fact that that model has a Poisson process's output, but real neurons have spike history, and we can add in a term to capture that spike history dependence, uh, is one way we can make the model richer to capture, ca better capture input-output relationships of real neurons. Another idea, is that it seems actually a bit restrictive to think that neurons only depend on a one-dimensional linear projection of the stimulus. That's certainly not true in most, most settings, certainly not, even, even in the retina, um, it's the case that neurons are sensitive to more than one uh, linear projection. And so that brings us to a model that we'll refer to as the multi-filter LNP model, where instead of having a single filter, the stimulus gets projected onto a bank of filters. So here I've drawn one with three independent filters, and then the output of those filters can be thought of as, as providing a feature space for learning the neurons, uh, lear learning the neurons output. So this three-dimensional feature space here would then feed into a three-dimensional nonlinearity. The output of that nonlinearity now is the instantaneous firing rate of a neuron. All right, so, um, so I would say this is an alternative to the Volterra model. Both of them have multidimensional sensitivity, but this one emphasizes first compress to a small number of dimensions and learn an arbitrary nonlinear function, whereas the Volterra model kept you in the high dimensional space and restricted those classes of nonlinearities to just polynomials. All right, so the, emphasis, the, the philosophical emphasis on dimensionality reduction here is a little bit different. Um, and I should say this also brings up a point that I, I, um, I don't think I made explicitly before, that it's no longer technically a GLM if we fit the nonlinearity F. When you define an, a, a GLM, when, when you say I'm fitting a GLM, what you mean is that you've pre-specified your nonlinearity F and the parameters that you're learning are just theta. If you want to jointly optimize your filter parameters and your nonlinearity, technically that's no longer a GLM, all right? It would be an LNP model. You're fitting the linear part, you're fitting the nonlinear part, but um, it takes you outside this family of models with concave log likelihood functions. All right, so, so even with one filter, you can do that. Here are a couple, a couple different estimators that have been formulated for, um, for the multi-filter 
LNP model. One you might have heard of the most is the spike tree covariance method, which will use that second moment of stim the, the, all the stimuli that elicited a spike, take their second moment matrix, and then look at the, the eigenvectors of that matrix. All right, so that's a method developed originally by, um, by Bill Bialik and Rob DeRoyter um, back in the 90s, and has been elaborated since by, by um, Odelia Schwartz and Eero Simoncelli. Um, my group and, and a couple others have worked on a model called the generalized quadratic model, where this nonlinearity here um, is, oh, let's see. Yeah, we, we assume that they're combined by a quadratic form and then an exponential, just like the GLM, but we have a quadratic, a quadratic front end instead of a, a, um, a linear front end. And then a third technique is one known as maximally informative dimensions, which was first put forth by uh, Tanya Sharpie in 2004. And we showed in a recent paper is exactly equivalent to maximum likelihood. So if you've heard of MID before, you may not have known this relationship. This is equivalent to taking the log likelihood that I've already defined to you, uh, defined for you. The spike count, the, the, the spike count is Poisson distributed um, with inputs given by a cascade of a filter followed by a nonlinearity. If you optimize those parameters by maximizing the likelihood, that's exactly the same as maximizing the information between the stimuli and the responses as defined in this paper. So I should say, this paper takes a bit of a, an information theoretic motivation and says, why don't we find the filters that capture the most information about the response? But it's identical to fitting this, um, this LNP model by maximum likelihood. Well, yes? Oh, so you can't collapse them. So there, you've got n numbers that get nonlinearly combined is the key. So in the GLM, I have, so that's a great point. We talked about having multiple filters. You have a stimulus filter and a spike history filter, but then you add them together, and then it's a, it's a pointwise nonlinearity that has only a single number going into it, right? So, um, so it's equivalent to one linear filter that operates on the entire design matrix, even if there are separate parts for spike history and, and stimulus. This model instead is saying, I'm gonna take filter one output and filter two output, and I'm gonna nonlinearly combine them. So maybe this one goes through a sigmoid, this one goes through an exponential, and then I'll do something else. So some arbitrary nonlinearity, um, I should say that maximally informative dimensions approach tends to take a, fit a non-parametric function to this app. So they make a 2D histogram of all of the possible outputs of those filters, and then asks what the average firing rate is in each one of those bins. So it effectively looks like, a, a, yeah, it's effectively a, a non-parametric a non estimate with basis functions that are little little blocks that make up this nonlinear surface. Yeah, so that's, that's um, that, that actually brings back the question someone asked before. If you wanted the spike history filter to come in after the nonlinearity, that would put you in this larger family of LNP models with multiple filters that get nonlinearly combined instead of linearly combined. Okay. All right, so another direction to go, and so, so we, people expressed interest before in, in um, more biophysically plausible model. So one, one recent extension that, um, that my former grad student, Kenneth Latimer, worked out was to extend the, the GLM to a conductance-based model. So instead of having a single linear filter whose output was the membrane potential, we were able to rewrite the model um, as this, as th in this form. So there's one filter um, whose output defines an inhibitory conductance, and a second filter whose output defines an excitatory conductance, and then you have a, a nonlinear differential equation here governing the evolution of that membrane potential. It turns out this model, the surprising thing is, this model is exactly equivalent to the original GLM if these two filters, excitatory and inhibitory, are equal and opposite, all right? So if one is the negative of the other, this is the standard GLM. And it's not obvious here to see that. But basically, the total conductance is fixed, so this ODE here is uh, a linear ODE, and we're back in the world of a linear operator on your stimulus, followed by a nonlinearity, followed by Poisson spiking. But this model, if we don't restrict those two filters to be equal and opposite, we can now have nonlinear interactions. So you can get things like shunting inhibition. If the total conductance goes up, you can get, um, you can change the time scale of the membrane potential. And I should say the, the last part here, the instantaneous spike rate passes through a nonlinearity just like in the original, uh, just like in the original GLM. So this can give you shunting inhibition and it can give adaptive changes in dynamics. So if at high contrast, the cell is very fast and at low contrast, it becomes very slow, um, we can capture that by this sort of nonlinear interaction of conductances. So this is taking us one step closer to um, a, a, a G, taking the GLM and interpreting it in terms of underlying biophysical mechanisms. Um, we actually took this model and then fit it to spike train data 
Um, so Fred Wiecki's lab had collected some recordings from uh, parasol ganglion cells in which they measured spikes, and then they also patched into the cell and measured intracellular conductances. So they measured separate excitatory and inhibitory conductances in response to a stimulus. And then we were able to make, we were able to fit this model using just the spike times and predict those separate conductances. So I should, so the, um, the blue trace here, this is the excitatory conductance, and the, here the, the um, yeah, the blue trace is the, ex, sorry, Black is the true conductance that was measured in, the, in, in excitatory conductance and inhibitory conductance, and our model fit just to the spike times, was able to predict those, con uh, those conductances with an R squared of yeah, 0.6 and 0.5 here. So it's not a perfect, uh, a perfect fit, but I think it's quite remarkable. Again, this works in retina, and it may not work in other areas, but we're able to take the sequence of spike times that you observed and then fit a model that postulated underlying conductance changes and was able to recover and now predict what conductances were actually measured in response to those same stimuli in, in a real neuron. Okay, so that's, that's, one, that's one biophysically oriented extension. And there's actually been a huge amount of work uh, of similar spirit. So I, I just wanted to highlight four, four particular ones. So Dan Butt's group formulated a model called the nonlinear input model. I, I, this is now my, I'll give you a survey of some of the other relevant points of, of interest. If you're interested in the GLM and you have a data set that isn't adequately explained by it, this gives you some sense of what are the other kinds of approaches that people have taken. So how have they, generally these are component-based models that took things like the GLM and added additional nonlinearities, other noise sources, other feedback terms to go beyond the GLM family, but to get a model that was then more accurately able to, um, to predict spikes. And in these cases, we're also somewhat motivated by, uh, by biophysical um, concerns. So this model ends up being an LNLN. So there's linear filter, nonlinearity, and then another stage of linear filters and nonlinearity. And it has a particular inhibitory component that was shown. It, this model can capture the onset of a rapid onset of spiking in LGN much better um, than the standard GLM. Here's a model from Steve Backus's group at Stanford that they called the LNK model. So the linear filter followed by a point nonlinearity. And then the output of this point nonlinearity governs the rate constant or several rate constants in, uh, in a, um, a, a, bio, a, kinetic, a kinetic system here. So you have, you have different quantities that are being converted into, into different states, and those indirectly then, or those directly regulate the probability of firing. Okay, so this is similar to our conductance based model before, I should say, similar to this one, and that you have a, um, a nonlinear ODE, which, which is driven by a, um, an LN system. So LN at the front, but then an, uh, an ODE at the back instead of just a, a pointwise nonlinearity in firing. Um, this one maybe gets the, the points for the best acronym. It's the LNF-DSNF model from Tim Gollish and Marcus Meister's groups. Um, that stands for non linear nonlinear feedback delayed sum nonlinear feedback. All right, so not to get carried away, but you can see that, and I should say, this, is, this model is awesome. Uh, this is a model of, of ganglion cell responses in the retina where these particular mechanisms were shown to actually exist in bipolar cells and amacrine cells. So they know that there are forms of delayed feedback that regulate the exchange of information between these different cell classes. So the diagram's too small for you to see here, but um, each little component here looks like something that has a feed-forward LN, and then the output of the N feeds back with a delay, not the spikes themselves, but the output of that nonlinearity feeds back with a delay onto that same neuron. And this looks a lot like what happens in these actual cells, and they were able to show that this model dramatically outperforms, um, I should say, all of the models on this, on this slide out, dramatically outperform GLM for predicting spikes. And then lastly, a family of models that, that also fall into LN, LN are, are, are sub, what are known as subunit models. So these have been invoked in, in a variety of areas where the output is not a linear combination of the light intensity, but rather the light intensity goes through some smaller subunits which are rectifying and then the combination, the linear combination of those subunits is what drives firing. So this is, you can see this is an LN, this is the, the figure from um, Brett Vinch's paper with Tony Mopchin and Eros Simoncelli. There's one stage of LN here where the initial linear stage has the same weight profile which is just convolved across the image. So this is like a convolutional neural network, uh, two-stage convolutional neural network. It's got this one weight vector which is convolved with the image and then there are some pooling weights that combine, oh, I, I see, an, an output nonlinearity, then pooling weights, and a final nonlinearity to drive, uh, to drive spiking. All right. Okay, so that takes us all the way to, you know, the state of the art now. Everyone is excited about deep learning, deep neural networks. And, um, you know, here's a diagram. That, and I should say, a number of, of groups have actually sought to fit these deep neural networks to directly to spike train data. So you're probably familiar with 
the Yaman's approach and, and Jim DiCarlo's lab, um, what they've done is very exciting. They've taken a pre-trained network and then just trained a GLM on the intermediate stage of that network. So the network was trained to discriminate natural images, right? Just trained to, to perform an artificial intelligence task, object recognition. And the idea is that if, if that, that model is processing images in a way that will allow you to distinguish boats from uh, hats, then, um, then the, unit, the representations at intermediate stages might be good for predicting what real neurons do. So effectively, they trained a GLM on the outputs from intermediate stages of the network fed those weights into a predictor for what the neural activities were. And then these are two papers from, um, from Saria Ganguly and um, Steve Backus that also that, that sought to fit, fit a standard convolutional deep neural network to spike train data um, and, and get some performance. So I mean, what I would, uh, some improvements in performance over the standard model. What I would say is that if you understand GLMs, you already understand um, deep neural networks. A GLM is just an LN model with noise at the end. And effectively, deep neural networks could be thought of as stacking multiple GLMs on top of each other, where we defer the noise until the very end. So if you think of just LN, 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 that would be a four-layer deep neural network with Poisson noise at the end would be the appropriate noise family for the kind of data that we have. Um, and, it's, and we can use the same tools we've already talked about, gradient descent to, find, to maximize the likelihood. There are great software packages now to do that gradient descent for you. In fact, you don't even have to compute the gradients by hand anymore. And there are so, uh, many tricks, of course, for overcoming the fact that these likely, the, the likelihood surface for these models is often riddled with local optima. But somehow it seems to be, I think people for a long time were worried about those optima. They told us to stop worrying and just love, um, love the tricks and, and, um, and you can get good performance out of these. Okay, so, um, so, so I would say there are some trade-offs between these different models. And one in, in particular, the ones that I emphasized on the previous slide are going in, they're all sort of taking the components that we find in the GLM and combining them in new ways to get more accurate models of the data. But in some of these, um, they're, they're motivated by something that we know about the biophysics or they're trying to gain insight into the biophysics. Actually, that's not entirely fair. I should say this paper from Saria Ganguly actually fits a, a neural network blindly to the inputs and, uh, input stimuli and output spike trains. And they find that the internal subunits of the deep network map onto bipolar receptive fields quite nicely. So even in these blind approaches, you can find things that, that are biophysically inter interpretable. Yes? So the uh, uh, LN, 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 LN noise? That's right. Well, uh, what happens if you have the noise happening at each stage? So you can use it in all three biological or cognitive stimulation. Will you still get the good performance or will it be scraped up? Everything works, yeah. In deep networks, you just so I, I'm being flipped, but um, actually there is a model, there's one of the ways to regularize or to, to improve fitting of these models is something called dropout, where you will force some of the, the intermediate layer neurons to be zero on some trials. And so you could think of this as a, as a Bernoulli, Bernoulli noise, right? That I have inputs and I would have, I should say it's not exactly Bernoulli noise because it's not one or zero. It's basically saying take the value you would have had or threshold it and make it, make it only zero. Um, it's a great question though, and people have suggested that the reason, the reason I mention it, people have suggested that the reason dropout works well. So dropout is basically a trick that will allow you to train the network better, to find better performance. Um, people have argued that the reason it works is that it mimics biology. biology. Biological neurons have synaptic failures, so sometimes the neuron won't fire when it should, and so only some subset of the neurons will fire in re response to, to um, repeated presentations of the same stimulus, and that robustness to variations in the noise of a lower level can actually help you help you learn the model better. So in this case, basically, you have noise that's at each layer rather than yeah, I, that's right, with. that's right. I, I'm saying that the standard deep network is, looks like this, and in fact, you might even use some other. Well, you could use squared error here if you care, or you would have classification accuracy if you were doing, um, if you were predicting spike versus no spike. It would be Bernoulli GLM, but um, yeah. So I'm not I'm not modeling this as noisy stacked GLMs, but that's something we could try. I mean, I, I think that's, it's hard, this, this whole, I, I guess the advantage of deferring the noise to the very end is that it's easy to compute the likelihood in closed form. Actually, that brings up the latent variable stuff that I'll talk about in the very last, last section. But, um, because then the, this internal noise is something that we don't have access to. It's, it, the, the fitting problem becomes harder, let me just say that. Okay, I couldn't, any, any other questions about this? I couldn't let, the following paper slide by without a mention. So this is a paper from Conrad Curting's group that was initially titled, Modern Machine Learning Far Outperforms GLMs at Predicting Spikes. And so they took a couple different data sets and fit, um, and I guess the way I read this paper was a, it was a paper bashing GLMs. GLMs are old, they're old news, 
They suck. You shouldn't use them. You should instead use, quote unquote, modern machine learning methods. And I mean, part of, the, part of my issue with this paper, and I should say, I think this highlights actually what's, um, why, why actually taking some care in fitting these models to data um, is, is, um, is, is worth spending some time doing. Although the title says modern machine learning outperforms GLMs, they have six data sets, and on four out of the six, the neural network is worse than the GLM, right? So on this one, this one, and this one, the neural network is negatively correlated, right? Um, so I was gonna suggest a, a better title, GLMs outperform neural networks at predicting spikes, um, which of course would be an absurd title, okay? So I mean, of course, neuro, GLMs are a special case of neural networks. So there's no way in which we can say GLMs are worse the neural networks, they're a special case of neural networks. Deep networks are more flexible than shallow networks. So of course, deep networks can do things that shallow networks can't do. But it's not always the case that if you just train a deep network blindly, that you'll get better performance than a GLM. And I think it's interesting that in a paper where they were trying to make the opposite point, they ended up making the point that sometimes the simpler model is better um, for all four of these cases. And I should say in the, these two middle cases where the neural network was better were, were ones where they had manipulated the data in order to destroy a linear relationship between hand position and neural activity. So I, I would almost regard these, these as cheating here. Anyway, I, what, I, what I would say GLM is a special case of neural network, so there's no need to set up uh, an adversarial relationship between these models. GLM is a reasonable thing to start with. It's the right tool for some settings. It's not the right tool for all settings. Um, but it's a, often a good thing to start with uh, to, to work, move on to other, other models. Okay, I'll get off my hobby horse there. Um, okay, so let's, in the last 20 minutes, let's talk about, oh yeah, question. Oh, the other models are boosting. So the best one, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, the other models were boosting. Um, boosting is, is a model which involves training, you know, a lot of weak learners and then combining them. And that's, that's better, so that's, that's worth knowing. And then the last one is ensemble methods, which um, also, ensemble methods involves averaging, pooling the responses of multiple methods. Actually, this plot doesn't also show random forests. Random forests were worse than the GLM at all of these. So anyway, uh, I guess I, I feel like Conrad has been, I'm sure he's not here, so I can, no one will tell him. Um, <laughs> So don't use GLM, just use machine learning. And I think that's a message which I would push back against. I would say GLM is part of the toolbox of machine learning. And um, of course you can get, if all you care about is prediction performance, you may get, honestly, almost always the, the, the ensemble, something that combines a lot of other models will do better if your only goal is to predict spikes. Um, and it is interesting that the boosting model is so good here, and it might be worth looking into that further. But um, I guess I don't think we should disparage other models, just, you know, I, I should say, this paper was framed in a way that these other papers were not. These other papers that were extensions of the GLM did not say, GLM suck, you should instead use this model, right? They were saying, saying you can get improvement by taking the GLM and extending it in some useful way. And to me, that's a more constructive way to frame the relationship. To their credit, I should say, they have retitled the paper on archive. It now no longer says far outperforms, it just says outperforms. So, <laughs> which I still would take issue because, I mean, I, I, unless, I think really, they could title it Boosting Outperforms, Boosting and Ensemble Methods Outperform GLMs, but GLMs outperform random forests and neural networks, but it's too long for the title. So, I mean, I, anyway, I, my, my, I, I would like to see us have a less adversarial relationship between these models and sort of instead try to think about how we can synthesize them or take the things that make one model work and, and uh, extend them to another. So that's, that's, yeah, that's another fair point, is that machine learning is, is vast. I mean, SVMs, I mean, we, I actually have been seeing some Twitter posts recently about whether ridge regression is machine learning or not. And so, I don't know, I'd, I'd say let's be generous. All sort of statistical modeling, we could lump under the, the branch of, of, uh, of machine learning, but that's gonna take longer to debate. We'll do that at the bar when Simon's Foundation starts giving us uh, the free drinks, maybe. Okay. Okay, so we've talked so far about encoding models. We've talked about, um, you know, these models, P of Y given X, that try to predict some measure of neural activity from an external vector, some, some external correlate, let's say. The correlate could be the stimulus, of a, a sensory stimulus, it could be spike trains from other neurons, it could be a motor behavior, it could be some other variable that we think is represented in the brain. But what if there is no stimulus, all right? So what if we're in a setting where we observe some neural data um, 
We observed some neural data that, that seems to have some structure underlying it, but there's no stimulus that we can regress against. This brings up a, a second family of models that I'll refer to as latent variable models, where we still want to map, we want to find some simplified x that explains the pattern of variability in these y's, but we don't have access to it. So again, as I said at the, at the very start, a latent variable is just another name for a, an unobserved or hidden variable that's some additional source of stochasticity that we don't get access to. So it's, it's hidden from us. And so the way to formulate these models now is, of course, we, don't, we can't just specify p of y given x because we don't know what x is. We also have to formulate a prior over x that's going to tell us what kind of structure we think that, that, that is underlying these data. And so the way I, I like to think about this, these are attempts to, we, all we get to see are the spikes, but they seem, oh, actually, never mind. Why don't I show you the example? Here's a motivating example um, credited to um, Jakob Maki, um, made this example. And I should say this is simulated data, so of course it's easy. But this is spike train simulated from 50 neurons. And if I just told you, you know, these are 50 neurons uh, spike responses in response to uh, no stimulus at all. This is just the brain sitting there in the darkness, or, or, or maybe there was a stimulus, but we didn't know what it was. Or the animal was wandering around in a, in a box, but we didn't record its spatial position. All we have are these spikes. What are we going to do? Clearly, these spike responses are not homogeneous Poisson processes all firing away at some, some rate. Um, in fact, what we might like to do is we might like to notice that, well, in fact, we've, we've aligned these so that it, the, the, the pattern pops out. But there's some, one group of neurons that's firing early and while the others are silent. And there's another group here that's firing while the other are silent. So we might be able to infer that there's some low dimensional structure, maybe two, a two dimensional latent variable that can explain this complex pattern of spiking across n neurons. All right? And so our goal is to design methods. Yeah, our goal is to design methods that will take just the observed data y and try to uh, infer simplified structure here uh, in the form of latent variables. OK, so I'll try to. And so really, what you could think of this as, this is again not going to bag, this is not bagging on GLMs. These are GLMs where we don't know what the x is, OK? So they're, they're models where we have, before we knew x and we knew y, and we tried to fit these weights. We tried to fit the weights from x to into this LNP model to predict y. And now we're also trying to predict what x is itself. So our, our goal is to find shared structure underlying y. You could think of this as a chicken and egg problem. In fact, one of the fitting methods that we'll talk about briefly is, has, the, has the form of a chicken and egg problem. We could think about updating our beliefs about what the latent variable is, and then training y from that x. And then given those weights uh, into these neurons, update our beliefs about x, right? So if we knew, if we had a better idea of what the latent variable was, we could better predict how each neuron was, was coupled to that latent variable and, and sort of bootstrap our way into some, some kind of clarity about what the brain is doing. OK. So, but it's worth, before we get too far with these models, why is it that these, these latent variable models, I'm going to just assert it, are actually much harder to work with than the regression models we've seen so far? And this also relates to the question earlier about why not put noise in the middle of the deep network um, why only put it at the end? Um, the reason is that it's very hard to compute the likelihood for latent variable models. So just to, to, to show you that, to contrast, when we had a sensory encoding model and we knew x and we knew y, we could, in closed form, compute the log likelihood, right? For the Poisson model, we said this is just the log of the firing rate times the spike count minus the firing rate itself. Just those two terms, sum those up across all time bins, boom, you're done. Compute gradients, go uphill, and you'll, you'll have an answer. Latent variable models, on the other hand, um, have, they, they basically, we don't know x. And so instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fit the model using the p of y, the log probability of the spike trains. That's all we have is we were trying to say what setting of this latent variable model, p of x and p of y given x, would maximize the probability of, of the data. OK? And the problem is that in a latent variable model, that log probability of the data is only available to us in the form of an integral, right? So it requires taking the product of p of y given x times p of x. That's the joint distribution over y and x. And then integrating over, so we have to take this integral um, of, the, of this joint distribution before taking the log. All right, so before I remember when I said we want to work with log likelihoods wherever possible, here we were able to work directly with the log likelihood. Here we have to work with the likelihood times the prior over the latent variable, sum that up across all the possible values that the latent variable could have had, and then take the log. We have to optimize that quantity. So we have to optimize log p of y for the model parameters instead of getting to directly work with, um, you know, work with log likelihoods themselves. 
And the problem is even worse when we get to latent dynamical models. So I'll sketch for you the idea of a latent dynamical model is that there's some time structure in the spike train data which is captured by a low dimensional signal x. So in this case, we not only postulate a mapping from x to y in the same time bin, this would be like our GLM, right? GLM weights would have a coupling from each neuron's spike response to the latent variable. But then we also have some, some dynamics that describe how the latent variable evolves through time. So a common assumption is that they evolve smoothly through time, or maybe they're rotational dynamics. Um, I'll talk about some of the specific assumptions in a, in a few slides. But now we have not just a single latent variable for each spike count, we have an entire latent path. So, right, so, so in, in fact, the likelihood now, log of p of y, is given by this nasty equation on the right-hand side here. We have to take the product for any particular latent path we have to compute the probability, we have to compute these two probabilities. The probability of the next point on the latent path arising from the previous point on that path, that's this dynamics equation here. Probability of x at time t given x at the previous time bin. Um, and then multiply that by the probability of observing these data p of y from that value of the latent variable, okay? So for any particular latent path, I could predict this equation, but I then need to integrate it over all possible latent paths. All right, and that involves a high dimensional integral where the dimensionality of that integral is the number of bins in that path. So if I have a, a latent path that goes for 100 time steps, then I'm effectively taking a 100 dimensional integral. That's integrating over all possible values of the latent variable in the first time bin, second time bin, third bin, et cetera. All right, so this is, this is quite difficult to work with just naively. And so there, so I should say, inevitably when you work with, when you want to fit latent variable models to data, you have to use a variety of, of computational tricks or, or techniques that are much more difficult than the ones that we needed for GLMs, okay? So and I should say, I'm only going to give you a very cursory introduction to these models. Maybe this is an idea for next year's tutorial if they don't decide to cancel the whole thing after my performance this year, um, would be to do a whole tutorial on latent variable models because there's a very rich and a very deep literature and I'm only going to scratch the surface here. So I'm, I'll just briefly mention three of the ways that are very popular right now for fitting latent variable models to data. So one approach is, um, is to sample, it's called sampling, um, which is also known as fully Bayesian inference. Um, or MCMC stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And the idea is that this is, in fact, in the Bayesian approach, you generally don't want to find point estimates of your parameters. You want to find the whole distribution over your parameters that are consistent with the data. All right? And so MCMC for latent variable models often involves something that's, that, that's called Gibbs sampling, where we alternate between sampling the latent variables and sampling the parameters. All right? And there are particular, particular tricks that allow us to do that, but you could think of it in the following way. I make an initial guess of my parameters, from that the guess of my parameters, I, make, uh, I can basically sample a single latent path. From that latent path, I can update my sample of the parameters, update a sample of the, of the latent path. If I go back and forth in this, in this way for a long time, I'll have a long list of parameter values, and I'll have a long list of um, latent paths. And if what I care about is the optimal parameters, I can now just ignore the latent paths and take that stack of parameter values, and those would be, the, that, those would be samples from the posterior over the parameters given the data, all right? So this is a way to get access to the full uncertainty about the model parameters given the data, which is something we might want anyway, but this tends to be something that's, that's fairly expensive um, and takes a long time to compute, especially compared to just gradient descent in, you know, even in deep networks with millions of parameters, we can get gradient descent to work, um, work very, very rapidly. Okay. Um, all right, so another, another approach is, um, something known as expectation maximization. I didn't, I didn't write out all of the math for these, uh, these different methods, but this involves expectation maximization as a technique for finding maximum likelihood estimates of latent variable models, all right? So um, remember I said that it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. I should say EM is not equivalent to optimizing the latent, optimizing the parameters, optimizing the latent, optimizing the parameters. I regularly review papers where people say that they're doing EM but they're actually doing coordinate, they're actually doing what I just said. They're finding the, the most likely setting of the latents and then the most likely setting of the parameters. That is not EM, okay? EM involves updating the parameters and then updating a posterior over the latents. So in the E step, you update your posterior beliefs about the latent variables, and then given that whole posterior distribution over the latent variables, you can easily make updates to your, for certain families of models, you can update the parameters. The simplest one you might have seen before is um, for fitting a mixture of Gaussian's model for clustering. Um, you make an initial assignment, you basically, you set down some cluster centers, some, some centers of Gaussians, and then the E step involves asking, what, given the current parameters, how likely is each data point to belong to each cluster? And then using those probabilistic assignments in the M step, you update where those clusters live. 
but you, you take into account the full posterior. So EM is a method that works very well for simple kinds of latent variable models. Um, increasingly, people are turning towards um, a, an approach known as variational inference, which is closely related to expectation maximization. And again, it's beyond, um, beyond what I have time to get into today. The idea is to optimize a lower bound on the posterior over the parameters. All right, so in, in particular, they, they formulate a tractable posterior over the parameters that can be optimized in the sense of minimizing the KL divergence to the true posterior. The beautiful thing about variational ed inference is that there are a lot of modern probabilistic programming tools for fitting those models to data. So in particular, there's a language called STAN. There's another one called Edward, developed by a Dave Blyes group out of uh, Columbia, that, that allow you to put you back into the world where figuring out how to do inference, figuring out how to take these samples, or deriving the updates in EM is something that's handled by an interpreter down inside the code. All you have to do is to say, I want to assume that X has a Gaussian prior and Y, uh, there's some nonlinear transformation, and Y then has a, let's say, a, a GLM on top of it, a Poisson GLM. And you specify the form of the model and you hit go, and these methods will automatically optimize that lower bound. And I should say, getting them to work still sometimes takes, takes a bit of effort, but it's getting to the point where you can, you can just, you, if you wanted to test out a model, um, you can write down a few lines of code the sp specifying the, the distribution of the latent variables and another specifying the mapping from the latent variable to your data and then hit go and this will work out very nicely. So anyway, it would be nice to have maybe a tutorial on that um, some other time. In general, if we want a, a, a view, and this is not by any means a comprehensive list, I just thought I'd, I'd sort of lay out the space for you a little bit. Um, the space of latent variable models, you can really think about it in terms of, again, these are, these are modular models just like the GLM. They consist of two main components, um, a prior over the latent variable, so p of x, and a mapping function, um, p of y given x. So, so far, we've focused the whole talk on p of y given x using GLMs and their various extensions. Um, and if we equip that, that model p of y given x with many different choices of p of x, we get different settings of latent variable models here. And I just laid out a few in this table here. So if we let the latent variable be discrete and, the and, and have the mapping function just be purely Gaussian um, random variables, we actually have a model which is a mixture of Gaussians. This is something you use for clustering. This is what people commonly use for spike sorting. Um, on the other hand, we could say that our latent, so I should say discrete means that it takes one of, one of, a, of k different distinct values. So each, each of those k different values has a different mean and a covariance of the Gaussian, and that's the mixture of Gaussians here. All right, <clears throat> and the data then are, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the end. Um, if instead we want a continuous latent variable governed by a Gaussian, and typically this would be a low dimensional latent variable that then gets mapped linearly to a higher dimensional space and then Gaussian noise is added, that's the factor analytic model you may have heard of before. Factor analysis, this is the latent variable that that corresponds to. My data are actually, the, the whole model is Gaussian because this composition of one Gaussian with another Gaussian um, keeps you in the family of Gaussian models. So this, this, this model is very nice to work with. PCA is a special case where you assume that the amount of noise added to each neuron is the same. If you have different amounts of noise added to different neurons, so one way to think of this again, this is a low dimensional, let's say two dimensional latent variable, which I then map by a, um, let's say a 50 by two matrix to a 50 dimensional space, and then I add noise to each neuron. That's the factor analytic model. If the noise that I add to each neuron is the same, then PCA will recover the mapping from this high dimensional space back to the latent variable. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if they're different noise in different neurons, then factor analysis has no closed form solution and you have to use EM or some other method to optimize it. Okay, so a family of models that's become increasingly popular in neuroscience are linear dynamical system models where the latent variable undergoes linear latent dynamics. So there's a low dimensional quantity that obeys a linear system. So what can linear systems do? They can decay away to zero, they can spiral outward, uh, sorry, they can run off to infinity or they can spiral. And, and any combination of those. So they can spiral inward, they can spiral outward. That's roughly what they can do. And if we equip that kind of model with linear Gaussian mapping, then we get linear dynamical systems. And the most famous example is, is um, you can think of the Kalman filter smoother is an example of this kind of model. Um, and or the other model that you, the, the two that you, that you see the most in the engineering literature are common filtering and hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models generally allow discrete latent variables and have transitions uh, and can have any kind of mapping to data. So in the case of a hidden Markov model for spike train data, this is something that, that you've seen. Um, uh, Zhe Chen has done a very nice job of this fitting hippocampal place cell data with each 
place in a, in a, um, in a place field is a discrete location, and then the, each location maps to a vector of Poisson firing rate. So this mapping here would be a GLM with tuning curves. Um, then you get a hidden Markov model that can be fit to extract an animal's latent uh, position from spike train data alone. Okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm basically out of time. I wanted to highlight one, one recent entry, and I should say a lot of the, the entries involve just picking richer families for the latent variable. So one, one particular nice one from uh, Scott Linderman, I think is here maybe, is a switching linear dynamical system. So it's a combination of discrete transitions with linear dynamics. You have a finite number of linear systems. Maybe in one state you have linear dynamics that rotate this way. In another state you have linear dynamics that contract towards zero. In a third state you have linear dynamics that go outwards. And you can switch between those linear dynamical systems and then equip it with a Poisson GLM to get his model. Um, here's a, a related model um, or another model in that family, which I think is, is, is I wanted to end by highlighting. This is work from, um, from Memming. Um, and they formulated the latent variable with a Gaussian process prior. So this is a, a, a prior over the latent variable that basically just says things should be smooth. And the degree of smoothness is determined by the parameters of that, uh, of that Gaussian process. So here is an example with two smooth latent variables and then the output mapping is a Poisson GLM, just like we saw. So there's a, a weight. Each neuron gets a weight from these two latent variables, and then it has a nonlinear function, Poisson spiking with feedback, just like we saw in the regular GLM. And so he, he, he made a very nice video showing this model fit to data, which I thought was worth, uh, worth highlighting, just to show you the kind of the power of these models. So these are data. I'll just say briefly what the data are. These are data from 63 simultaneously recorded V1 neurons in a paper by Tony Mofshin and Arnulf Graf. The stimuli were drifting sinusoidal gratings at 72 different orientations. And so um, what, what Memming and, and, um, and Yuan did here was not to regress the orientation against the spike responses. They treated this as a latent variable modeling problem. They said, show me just the spike trains, and from these spike trains, can I infer some latent organization? Can I infer a low dimensional quantity which is smooth in time, which can account for all of these, all, all of these data. And so what this, um, let's see if this works here. Oops. Okay, so what, what, what the video will show is um, the inferred latent trajectory. So this is from all 63 neurons, they inferred a three-dimensional latent space. And so this trajectory here is the average trajectory in response to one of the drifting gratings. So this is like PCA on steroids, basically. PCA would not, not recover this. They're saying that from the, the 63 neurons spiking along, they were able to infer an underlying latent variable that started here and then walked over here, and then it spirals around and around and around and around, all right? And so what do those spirals correspond to? They correspond to the period of the sinusoidal grading, right? So without knowing that the, the they didn't know anything about the stimulus here. The, the, the latent variable model extracts the fact that there's this rotational structure in three dimensions uh, during the, 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 the one second that the stimulus is on the screen, and then after it goes off, the firing rate goes back to zero. So that's one of the orientations. If I then show you the other, I should say there are 36 directions, 72 total stimuli, um, they actually live on a torus. So that was one of the 72 stimuli. Now we'll sh show all of them. This is the latent trajectories for all 36 different directions shown simultaneously as a movie. So the initial, initial location in latent space is right here. And then for every different grading that comes on, the latent trajectory, and remember this is the, the three-dimensional quantity which is linearly mapped to the firing rate of 62 neurons and then exponentiated to get their, their positive firing rates. Um, each one lives at a slightly different location in this three-dimensional latent space. They all have this, um, and I should say, this reflects the topology of orientations th themselves, which if I go all the way around the circle, I get back to where I started here. All right, so here's an example where we actually, in some sense, knew what we should expect, which is these stimuli live on a, uh, uh, they live on a circle. Um, but I think the exciting thing about latent variable models is that using the sort of, the, the tools that we started to develop, GLMs for coupling X to Ys, and then priors of the latent variables. Imagine we can apply these techniques to, to areas of the brain where we don't know yet what the code is, or find, uh, find aspects of organization that were not already explicit. So I should say, mostly people have applied these to either hippocampus, where we know, just if I hand you the spike trains from hippocampal place cells, you should expect that maybe there's a code for some 2D latent variable. 
Here, there's a code for the, the orientation and the phase of a V1 stimulus. But when we look at higher order brain areas where we don't yet know what the code is, or we don't have any good things to regress against, latent variable models hold enormous promise for showing us what the underlying structure is. Let me, sum, let me just do my summary and then I'll take questions. We're at four o'clock right away. So um, yeah, I've talked for a long time now about descriptive models that seek to capture structure in the data. Um, there are formal tools for comparing these models, which I didn't mostly discuss. Um, but I think one of their virtues is they can be used for both encoding and decoding analyses via Bayes' rule. And they're modular, so they're easy to build, extend, generalize. I can take Memming's model and say, well, he has a linear mapping from the latent variable to, um, to the spike trains. What if instead I thought there were nonlinear tuning curves that mapped each, uh, the latent variable? That's, that's actually the poster that, um, that my, my student, Anchi, will be presenting, not tonight, but tomorrow night. So um, that's a little plug for, but, but I should say, there's a rich family, and uh, another one to mention is um, the LFADS model from David Cicillo takes the, um, takes the latent dynamical structure. Instead of having a Gaussian process here, they use a recurrent neural network. So you can mix and match these models. I, I should say you're limited by the fact that some models may be more or less tractable to fit to data. So we're limited by, I guess, our imagination and the, and the tricks that we can come up with for fitting them. But I think they hold enormous potential for, um, for revealing structure of the data. So the big picture. Large-scale recording technology is advancing very rapidly. I think there's lots of interesting structure in high-D neural data, and so there are big opportunities. If you're interested in these kinds of things, I'm actually trying to recruit postdocs right now, so please come talk to me. There are lots of cool things that we can do um, moving forward. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Feel free to go if you want to go, but I'll take questions if somebody wants to ask. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it would, pro it would probably be, I mean, I th it's, a, it's a point well taken. The, 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 let me see if I can summarize it. So you're saying, unless we show the right stimuli, we might not find the interesting structure. And, and I, would, I, mean, I, would, I would add to that that if we found some latent variable underlying some spikes, but we couldn't relate it to anything about the organism, like maybe it's related to like a memory or a, you know, ultimately we want to know, well, what is that? If we just know like this is some P of X, which has a Gaussian distribution, we're, it's kind of unsatisfying. So I think of this as a tool for data exploration. So first of all, yes, you have to show the stimulus. You have to put the animal in a, in a rich behavior that you maybe care about studying. I think the days of having an anesthetized monkey stare at a screen of white noise, um, certainly we still have a lot to learn from that, but that's not going to get us all the way to understanding what's being represented in these brain areas. So we need rich tasks. And then we also will need to, once we're done with this model, we don't just you know, declare victory. We then want to maybe find out what these latent variables, how are, how are they related to sort of other, other quantities that the brain might care about? So yeah, there, there's lots, lots more to do after, even after finding something interesting in a data set. Yes? The, the parameters are, are discrete? I don't know of any cases where, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I consider where the latent variable was discrete or continuous. The parameters are discrete. I guess you could imagine, um, so one kind of discreteness is sparsity. I don't know if you would count that. We could say the, the parameters are either zero or they're, we, we, if we said they're either zero or one, um, that, that might be a model where we think there's a, a uniform like coupling strength and each neuron is either coupled with strength one or it's coupled with strength zero. Yeah, I, yeah, so you could, okay, fair enough. You couldn't do gradient descent, you would be, but, but um, in that case, MCMC should work. Still, so you can sample, yeah, how likely am I to be in each of these parameter states? I can't think off the top of my head any, of any cases where we have discrete parameters, but I can imagine that there might be cases where, where we would. Yeah, and you're right, then gradient descent is, is out the window. Yes, Eric. 
Well, I mean, I'd say we're already in that world. So the question is, well, you know, what are we going to do if we get into models that are non, that, that get outside the simple Poisson GLM or Bernoulli GLM that have a guarantee on con concavity of the likelihood function, log likelihood function. We're already in that world. I would say the interesting models are already outside that. Um, and so I guess, yeah, this gets back into the question of like, what are your model desiderata? So, you know, maybe the, the, the paper that Conrad published um, made the argument that all we care about, uh, sorry, I was going to put this up to say, well, we can still compare them using log likelihood, right? So you have, in fact, LFAD's paper does this. They take, they take the LFAD's model and they compare it to several other models and they ask which one assigns highest log likelihood to the test data, I think. There's also other ways we can compare models, something called co-smoothing, where I fit the model parameters, I fit the model parameters to one data set. I then show you a subset of the neurons on the test data. From those subset of the neurons, can you now infer what the other neurons should do? Right? So if you've correctly extracted the low, low dimensional structure, right? I've got 100 neurons, I showed you 90 of them, and because you know the coupling under this underlying structure, you can predict what 10. So we can still do straightforward comparisons of like which model assigns higher probability to the data. So that's, I would say, but that's only one axis that we might care about. We, we might also really want the, the models I mentioned earlier that go some distance toward um, relating these to biophysical structures. So some people think an RNN is a step forward because an RNN looks maybe more like a real network of coupled neurons. The RNN has a, maybe an interpretive disadvantage because it's got many, it's not low dimensional, right? It's got high dimensional. So we, we might argue we don't understand. The nice, what I love about Memming's video is that it's a three dimensional latent space that we can look at and interpret. Um, but if LFADS is a better model that's not interpretable, then uh, we're scratching our heads. I, guess, I mean, there, there are people trying to, trying to reduce um, RNNs to simplified models as well. I, yeah, I would say it depends a lot on what you care about. And hopefully we care about all these things. We don't only care about prediction performance and we don't only care about interpretability. And I think there's exciting opportunities for you know, bridging, those, bridging those divides and making, making the complex models more interpretable, making the interpretable models richer, et cetera, so we can work from, from both directions. I mean, I'm an optimist, so I would say that, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, I think there's a lot of, look around Cosine, there's lots of people doing this kind of stuff right now, actually. Okay, oh, okay, last, last question. Say it again, sorry. Uh huh. Here I can have any observation model. I'm just, this is a general picture. So the observation model is whatever connects X to Y. So it could be a GLM, it could be a, the factor analytic model is just linear and Gaussian noise. So you're saying it's, it's difficult to, to implement inference or it's difficult to decide which one to use? Decide is easy, right? So I mean, I think that's, you look at your data and you ask, is, it, is the final factor bigger than one or not? If it's bigger than one, then. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the name of the game, is, is if we observe something like that, that would be quite puzzling, right? The highly regular spiking part of the time, and then it enters a different mode where it's disorganized and has, has super plus on variability. Can we make a latent dynamical model that exhibits that? I mean, we could make a regression model probably that, that would do that. Um, I don't know, it's an open, open question, but I mean, how to, I mean, Memming's model has these, um, I should say, these, these spike history feedback terms can give you super plus on or sub plus on spiking. Now, whether it can give both in the same model, I don't know. But it might be that there would be, yeah, I don't, I'd have to think more about it. But that's an interesting puzzle. I, I mean, I love it when, when I, in fact, for me, it's like it's often depressing. You find, at least in the BMI literature, people find they want to decode hand position from the neural activity. Common filter works 
I'm not up on this literature, so I could be wrong, but it seems like a lot of them, it's like common filter is already like almost as good as you can do. A linear dynamics with linear observations and Gaussian noise. It's, it's a standard model and it's already at ceiling performance. So there's no benefit to designing fancier models. Whereas it seems like in spike train data, there often we do find new structure that needs, that demands a new, a new kind of model. So I would say when, I, when someone brings me data and I can fit the linear Poisson model to it with closed form maximum likelihood, well, it's nice that, you know, it's a quick work but it's, it's more intellectually exciting maybe to find data that has these, these kinds of patterns. So if you see data, yeah, that's sort of negative binomial in one regime and binomial in another. Um, thinking about, I mean, I think one thing I like about the Stephen Backus paper, the LNK model, is it's motivated, the kinetics are m motivated by a model of available vesicles for release. So there's a, some attempt to take what we know about, and I, and I think for me as well, I'm not a pure machine learning statistician person, I like to take ideas from biology. So what do, what, what do we know about the way neurons work that we could use uh, to, to formulate models that are, that are maybe more accurate as well as, um, as well as more interpretable? Anyway, great question though. Thanks so much.